This is Conspiranormal. Because I have found out that most paranormal television these days is is garbage. Right. It's it's gotten worse right. and worse as it goes on. There's a few good things out there, but um, sure. but most of it is most of it is pretty bad now. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. That's that's part of it. It's you know most of it isn't really worth making time for. Um, I've enjoyed working with uh, uh, like Seth and those guys over at uh, Small Town Monsters. Yeah, yeah. That's In all. Fact, Seth, Seth is coming on at the end of February. Oh, on, nice on this show. So. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I did wa- I did actually watch um, the one that he did about the flying creatures. Terror in the skies. Yeah, that one was oh, that one yeah. was really good. I've seen I've seen quite a few of his. I've seen the Mothman one, the Point Pleasant <laughs> one, just the ones that are like kind of like free on like Amazon Prime, which are oh, probably sure. I think is like the majority of them at the moment. At this so. point, they all get up there eventually. You know, I think they usually start out, you know, being pay-per-view or, or whatever. But then, yeah, they, they they always end up there, which is fantastic. I mean, I I think they've done really well. Obviously, I, I don't have, you know, access to, like, the, the numbers. But they, they, they seem to be doing well, which is great. Right, right. Uh, I'm really impressed by I'm really impressed by his work. Uh, for, for being and being for being someone that doesn't have a major studio or any kind of like major network around him, he does, oh, yeah. he does really really well, and it, they're they're short, they're pretty concise, and they're pretty to the point. And he covers a ton of ground in those things. Like in that one, you know, he had you and Lauren Coleman, uh, mm-hmm. Allison Jornlin, quite a few other people were on that. We're on that episode. We're on that that show, so I was pretty impressed by it. Um, and I will, I want to get into some of that. We'll get into some of that stuff here in the interview. Oh, sure. So, um, kind of organically start. So, welcome to Conspiracy Normal, uh, episode two ninety nine. One episode to three hundred. So you get to uh, usher. You get to help usher that in, Tobias. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so welcome to Conspiracy Normal. Uh, we've got Tobias Wayland, and he is the author of a book called The Lake Michigan Mothman, which the subtitle is High Strangeness in the Midwest. And this is a subject that I've wanted to talk about for a little while now. Um, is the Lake Michigan, or otherwise known as the Chicago Mothman, and there's some really weird stuff to kind of get into into here, so let's just get into it. Ben, welcome to Conspiracy Normal. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. Uh, let's talk kind of like about your background and how sure. you got interested in studying this phenomenon and kind of compiling it about the whole Chicago Mothman cases. Let's get into that. Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to make it as succinct as, as possible. So, you know, I, uh, I experienced a, a slew of paranormal events starting when, when I was a, a child. And, um, you know, this was pre, pre-internet. And, um, you know, so what I would do, because I didn't really have anybody I could turn to about that, is I would go down to the local library. And, you know, I, I found books on uh, strange subjects on, on, on paranormal phenomena written by guys like Warren Coleman and, uh, and John Keel and Brad Steiger. And, uh, and, and those books had a, a huge impact on me. And, um, you know, they, they really let me know that there were other people out there, like real people, like actual people who were experiencing similar things. And so, um, you know, I, I became fascinated with the, the, the subject matter. And, um, you know, as I, I grew older uh, in my late 20s, I, I decided that I wanted to start investigating this stuff. You know, I wanted to, to kind of do my part, you know, to, right. to help. Well, to, to help people and, and to help people maybe try to to uh, understand this stuff, try to uh, make some sense of it. And uh, so I, I volunteered as a field investigator 
for the Mutual UFO Network. And, uh, you know, I, I did that for several years. And, and uh, you know, it was it was a, a good experience overall, I think. Um, wasn't, I would say that the, the organization isn't necessarily going in the same direction that, that, that I wanted to go in. Um, and so it, 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 it was a good experience. I, I think that it's taught me a lot about investigation. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I really felt like I needed to go in, in my own direction. And so I, I left there and I kind of bummed around for a, a, a couple of years. And then I, I met my uh, now wife, Emily. And, uh, you know, she, she didn't have the same background as me, but she had an interest in this stuff. And so, you know, my, uh, my, my degree is in English and, and, uh, her, uh, well, she has two actually hers are in, uh, design and photography. And so with our particular skill sets, we're like, well, we can do something with this, right? I mean, we're interested in this stuff. Um, we're passionate about it. We, we want to help people. There's something we can do here. And so we, we came up with the idea for the Singular Fortean Society. And what that evolved into over the, the course of its first year, because we, we really spent uh, most of 2016 when it, it uh, launched, we, we, we really spent most of that year just kind of figuring out what we wanted it to be. We had sort of a general idea. Um, and so what, what it evolved into by 2017 was a paranormal uh, news outlet in investigative team and then a community. And, and we thought those, those three things, you know, investigating paranormal phenomena openly and honestly, uh, reporting the news uh, again, openly and, and honestly, without a lot of hype or, well, or just taking it seriously, frankly, which is a, a huge problem from for most mainstream news sources. And then, um, you know, being able to form a community where people can feel safe talking about this stuff. Um, you know, those those were the 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 three tenets that 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 we 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 uh, basically came up with. And it's it's really been a very uh, fulfilling uh, project, you know, and, it, and like I said, I mean, it's, it's really been a way for us to be able to help people and, and I think sort of uh, help ourselves through that. And it was through the Singular Fortean Society that I first came across the uh, uh, flying humanoid sightings down, down in uh, Chicago. So, okay. you know, I had, uh, I had seen uh, three sightings in the spring of 2017. It was it was April 2017. Uh, come through the uh, uh, MUFON case management system, and uh, they were interesting sightings. Uh, so I, I I wrote an article about them for the the Singular Forty and Society and, uh, and and published that and. And, you know, honestly, I, I didn't really expect them to go anywhere. Uh, I thought they were interesting because they were relatively close to home. You know, I, I just live up in Madison, Wisconsin. So we're, you know, we're maybe two hours north of, of Chicago across the border. Yeah, not too, not um, too far. Yeah, I, honest. Well, it's, that, it's been real easy for us to get down there and, and, and do on-site stuff, too, when, when people are, are open to that, which is great. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I saw those come through and and there really wasn't much follow-up uh you know done by uh uh mufon i i talked to sam moranto who's the the state director down in in illinois there and um you know they they were never really able to to communicate with any of those witnesses the first three like those initial three and so you know the the investigation surrounding those was pretty lackluster, frankly. And uh, was it a lack of interest on in their part? Um, I think that well, there have been some some issues. I think with how Mufon has approached these. Yeah. Um, and 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 we can get into that a little bit. I I, I think just from my experience, um, working with with sam because anytime you know mufon gets any any one of these you know chicago or lake michigan mothman cases i reach out to him he's a nice guy and uh 
you know, I'll ask him about it. And he seems very reluctant to believe that any honest witness is going to be protective of their identity. And I mean, I understand that, you know, UFOs and and ghosts are mainstream enough where I think you get a lot more people willing to go on the record about them. But that hasn't been my experience with uh, witnesses reporting, you know, any any kind of monster sighting other than maybe Bigfoot. I think I think Bigfoot is popular enough where where people are are pretty willing to to talk about that one, too. Yeah, I I think that's the case now. Right. But I think also, too, with some of these cases that where it can, it's kind of understandable, and you mentioned this a lot in the book, that some of these witnesses are loath to come forward because they're a lot, there's a lot going on in like the Hispanic communities, and some people are worried about their immigration status. Yeah, that, that was part of it. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, you start talking about the, the sightings in like Chicago's little village. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, Manuel, that's Manuel uh, Navarrete at uh, UFO Clearinghouse. He literally uh, composed this um, notice in in Spanish that he disseminated throughout the the community down there. That basically said, "Look, like we're not cops. We're not with the government. We're not going to tell anybody who you are. We're not going to alert the authorities to you. It's just if you've seen something, you know, please talk to us." And we'll protect your identity because you're absolutely right. There are, um, un, you know, undocumented uh, uh, immigrants that 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 might be concerned about stuff like that. And and even um, you know maybe less uh, uh, impactful to to some people than you know maybe you know losing their livelihood and and and, and being deported or something. We had a lot of people who had honest concerns about their personal life and how a sighting like this could affect that. You know, um, I, I guess I don't really know what kind of, you know, stereotype people envision when, when they think of, of the, the type of person who would, you know, report something like this. Um, but I, yeah. I gotta tell you, it's, it's been across the board. I mean, literally every, socioeconomic uh, uh, class that that I can think of other than, well, I don't know, maybe maybe we don't have any one percenters or anything. But I mean, from working class all the way through, you know, professional people, we have witnesses from from every background and there are legitimate uh, concerns that they have about their personal life, you know, how a story like this, would uh, impact how others see them. Um, and, you know, I, and there are people who have careers that, you know, they have to try to protect, you know, because they're concerned. You know, can you imagine being a lawyer or a politician or something and coming out and saying, hey, you know, I, I saw this creature, this with bat like wings and glowing eyes and what that might do to your livelihood. I mean, of course people aren't going to, are, sure. they're not going to risk that. Yeah. Of course there's, they're not. there's, there's a ridicule factor that's there right. that I think that used to be there with UFOs and used to be there with Bigfoot. But with this stuff, you're talking about something that is so weird and so bizarre that people will think, well, they must think that I'm crazy. I think that, and that, that, I think that ridicule factor is enough to for some people to not want to be identified. I mean, it's. I think it's perfectly understandable. Oh, ab- absolutely, and 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 part of it was that the the most common narrative that I heard from witnesses was that you know they would have their sighting, which which um, was of great relevance to them. You know, like it 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 universally in the cases that I think um, are are paranormal or, or the most likely to be paranormal like the, it, it, it always evoked strong emotion like some some sort of significant reaction and those people 
they 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 would have their sighting. It would evoke that powerful reaction, and they would want to talk about it. And they would go to a a loved one, you know, of a spouse or a close friend or something, and they would tell them this story, and they would get laughed at by somebody they trusted, you know. And um, it, it it didn't want them. It, it it didn't make them want to talk about it, you know. Um, especially because most of these people now, you know, you and I have 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 heard of Mothman, and probably a lot of people listening who are are into the the paranormal and and follow this stuff. But you know what? Like outside of our weird little circle, nobody knows who the Mothman is. Nobody's familiar with the the Point Pleasant sightings. Right. 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 It just it 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 doesn't have the same you know, traction in this, well, in, in, in our cultural zeitgeist as, you know, say Bigfoot, for instance. Yeah, it's not something, it's, so, it's not something that's huge in the popular culture. Right. And, uh, and most people that, uh, well, most people with, with whom I've spoken had no idea anybody else had seen something similar. And so most often, you know, they would just uh, maybe Google something, to you know using keywords that that they use to describe this creature so maybe it would be you know giant bat or bat creature chicago or something and you know that's how they would come across maybe our website or you know uh lon strickler's uh, uh blog phantoms and monsters or ufo clearinghouse or something and uh, at that point they usually would be shocked to find out that all of these other sightings had had been reported because literally they just thought that nobody else had ever seen this thing and since they had already been laughed at by you know their their loved ones that they were just gonna have to live with this for the rest of their lives without ever being able to to talk to anybody about it yes and they get to talk about it with like phantoms and monsters and a lot of those are are anonymous and another theme that's in the book um there's a lot that you would go and follow up on phantoms and monsters material lawn maybe mm-hmm. lawn maybe would have spoken to them on the phone and then you would go and contact them and then sometimes it would just stop right there you weren't able to get in touch with these people like, anymore so that's another phenomenon that's kind of associated with this. That's a that was another trend that I noticed reading the book. That definitely happened. Um, you know, and it, it's difficult, I guess, to know exactly what to make of that. Now, it has happened in the past, not necessarily this investigation, but it has happened in the past where, you know, I've followed up on something and the person pretty quickly cut off all communication, uh, usually because I start asking uncomfortable questions. Like the best example I have of that was, you probably remember this. There was a, well, a frankly ridiculous dog man photograph circulating on the internet that was supposedly taken near Elkhorn, Wisconsin, which was or is famously the the site of the the uh, Bray Road Beast. Yeah, I, and I am so, familiar with what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and so Lon got this photo and and talked to this guy a little bit, and I was like, well, you know, I live like an hour away from there, dude. So, you know, what's this guy's contact info? Like, I'll reach out to him and and see if he'll take us out to the spot and, and talk to us. Obviously, I'll you know keep him anonymous if if, if um, you know he doesn't want people to know his name. That's no problem. And. And so I, I, I got his email address and I, I reached out to the guy and just never heard anything. And so Emily and I, of course, uh, go out there because, you know, he did give Lon a pretty um, detailed sighting location. So, like, we knew where to look because he told like he told him where he supposedly saw this thing. And we get out there and in that photograph, there is the speed limit sign. And that speed limit sign does not exist where he said he had his sighting. Okay. And so at that point, I have to conclude that it's a hoax because, you know, it's of course he didn't want to talk to me. Of course, he didn't want to take me out there. He knew he was full of it. Now, as far as 
the Lake Michigan Mothman is concerned, I didn't have the same level of doubt, I guess, about the people that maybe I would reach out to and 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 wouldn't hear back from. Um, because I, I didn't have the same level of, of evidence pointing towards their their story being wrong, frankly. Um, I never noticed with those people that there were details in their accounts that were factually incorrect. Um, I think that a lot of it could be attributed to the fact that Many people, once they have sort of absolved themselves of these sighting reports, you know, once once they've talked about it, um, I don't think they want to revisit it necessarily. I don't think they want it to be a huge part of their life. And the reason that I, I believe that actually is because of another common narrative that has emerged, um, especially with some of the, the, the more re- uh, recent sightings that I've, I've uh, recorded. So, you know, people will sometimes report like a, a, a palpable sense of, of evil. They'll, they'll describe that specifically. They, they use that word evil. And, um, and interestingly enough, a lot of these people have the belief that talking about this phenomenon, whatever it is, Talking about it has, or I, I, I should say, opens the possibility of somehow inviting it back into their life. Yeah. And they're terrified, and they don't want that to happen. And so they don't want to talk about it anymore. If you speak you know, of they, it, it will return. It will come back, yeah. Right. Um, and so there's this fear of reprisal. And um, they just they, they don't want anything to do with it. Although, I mean... I think the majority of the people whose contact info I I was given by Lon, I, I feel like, and I, I don't obviously have like hard numbers on this, but I feel like I was at least able to contact most of them and have some communication. But um, yeah, I mean, certainly there were people who, and this was difficult to explain to other people outside of the investigation. Um, You know, people also don't necessarily want, to uh, uh, go through a you know an, an endless string of investigators just to assuage your curiosity, um, and you know that's 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 probably part of it. Where they are scared, they don't want to run the risk of having this thing appear prominently in their lives again, and you know they they don't feel like they have to tell it to an in an endless string of, of who are seemingly you know just just curious about it so Let, let's talk a, I want to talk a little bit about kind of turning to explanations and possible things that we have to rule out before we get to the general and mysterious but one mm-hmm. of those that I kind of wanted to start out with is that there's a myth about Mothman that persists and I think that it persists because of the film. Uh, Mothman prophecies that mm. Mothman is some kind of harbinger of doom. <laughs> uh, yeah. A few years ago, I when Lauren Coleman put his book out about Mothman, uh, he was on a radio show, and the host could not get past the harbinger of doom stuff. Yeah. And this is something that is in that I think is drawn from Kill through the movie but kill never actually made any kind of explicit statement that he felt that the silver bridge collapse was because of the mothman sightings yeah i you know i i don't buy the the whole harbinger thing either um yeah yeah i mean keel uh, just going off of the, the the mothman prophecies book had now he was expecting some kind of disaster because of the you know the ominous messages and stuff he would receive but he thought it was going to be a a, a blackout on the east coast right right and, and so he, he 
And that wasn't really coming from Mothman. That was coming from all these other entities and all these other things that he was dealing with that was right. going on in his they, own life. If you read the book, that's what right. he's talking about. Yeah, that may or may not be be connected. You know, right. I mean, with with if Keel, everything was connected because it's all ultra terrestrials or, or yeah. whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's that's what he was dealing with. He had left Point Pleasant and then. You know the the Silver Bridge collapse uh, collapsed quite tragically and also quite famously in in December of '67 there, and um, you know I I I remember you know reading in the 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 book that he at least well went on record in you know the the Mothman prophecies as, as saying something like oh. Man, I'm going to butcher this because I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. So it, it was basically something about uh, uh, being tricked. Uh, I, I don't remember the the exact quote, but um, was this where he talks about how it's like a record endlessly skipping? Is this what kind of what you're? Getting well, it was, it was, I I got the distinct impression reading it that he felt at the time that um, basically he had been led to believe that you know this blackout was going to happen but really the silver bridge was the the disaster being yeah. portent yeah and um and i look i i don't buy it i i i really don't i think that what's happening here is that there is nothing people love more than a a nice tidy narrative they want you know, a beginning, middle, and end to their stories. And the Silver Bridge collapse, uh, as as awful as it was, provided an ending to to the the Mothman phenomenon for them. It 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 gave them an ending to their story. And it it allowed some context, you know, it 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 allowed some kind of of meaning to be taken out of out of all of it. But really, I mean, there's there's no causal connection that that anybody can can point to. So um, that combined with the fact that you know the the oldest historical sighting we've we've gathered actually uh, from uh, uh, Floyd Hancock was the the witness was in indiana in uh, 1969 so you know uh less than 400 miles and in two years out from uh the 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 last reported mothman sighting in in that flap you know there there have been sightings since in west virginia even but which is the other reason that I, you know, I, I think most researchers who are fairly knowledgeable about these reports don't don't buy the, the whole uh, uh, Harbinger thing. And, you know, you, you mentioned Lauren Coleman before, too, and, and he very uh, uh, famously and, and very importantly, I think, pointed out that, you know, uh, we have all of these other legends that have started now thanks to that movie. Uh, like the right. Blackbird of Chernobyl, for instance. Right. right. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody's ever been able to to source that story. I mean, you can't trace it back to a person uh, because it started on the internet after this movie came out. Right. Yeah. It started after two thousand one, which is when the movie came out, and there was nobody. I don't think anybody ever looked at any reports that said that yeah, it happened at Chernobyl, and that was a. And there, there's this, there is the, there is this whole thing though that enters into, and you do mention this in the book that. There is a thought that the police in Chicago or the powers that be or whatever have been covering some of this stuff up because they don't want to start a panic because they're aware of some of these rumors and stuff that are going along on the Internet. That's something. Mm. And I think whenever this started happening, a lot of people started thinking, because this was big in 2017, about three years ago, oh, a yeah. lot of people started thinking if something really bad is going to happen in Chicago. Because the mob I mean, it's Chicago. Like yeah. something really bad happens every <laughs> right. weekend, right? You know, right. right? Exactly, exactly. Which is an element I kind of want to come back to. But um, the explanations, some kind of the mundane explanations. Um, you know, Mothman in West Virginia was described as a sandhill crane, mm -hmm. and you do think that some of these sightings in Chicago are in that area are actually sandhill cranes. Well, I, I think that they're likelier to be great blue herons. Um, okay. 
But yeah, I mean, a large migratory bird. Ap- ap- absolutely. And I, I mean, I have really strong evidence that, that that's the case in, in some of these. Uh, I, I think they, they fit a profile, too. If you look at the sightings that um, happen during the day with no accompanying uh, paranormal phenomena and, and no stark you know, feeling of, of, of fear or anything like that. None of the, the, the terror or, or paranormal elements that uh, are, are indicative of the, the, the much weirder sightings. Uh, I mean, you see that what's being described could, could very easily be uh, something like a, a, a great blue heron. And even beyond that, you know, beyond all of the, the circumstantial evidence we have of, you know, things like climate change and 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 uh, habitat destruction leading to more, you know, herons having to, to, to live in these urban areas, even beyond that, is the uh, Pilsen photographs. Uh, you know, these are literal photographs from a, a witness that, that point towards... Uh, large migratory birds being a, a, a part of this. And so for anybody who isn't familiar with this already, um, back in 2018, uh, I, I believe Lon was contacted by him first, and I, I, I spoke to this witness later. Um, but there was a, a gentleman who was riding his bicycle to work in Chicago's Pilsen neighborhood. This was like the middle of the, the, the day. He was just riding to work, and luckily for all of us, he had one of those GoPro cameras attached to his bicycle helmet. Right. And so as he's bicycling to work, he sees this couple on the uh, street corner. It's a, a, a man and a woman, and the man's pointing at something in, in the sky, and the woman is also looking at it, and so that draws his attention. He looks up to see what they're they're so fixated on, and he sees what he describes as a giant bat creature, uh, and later amends that slightly uh, to say he thought it could have been some somebody in a wingsuit, and and that's pretty common, honestly. A uh, giant bat or man in a wingsuit for the daytime sightings are probably the two most common descriptors that we receive easily. Okay. Um, I, I want to address the man in the wingsuit, because that mm-hmm. was the next one that I was going to, as the quote-unquote mundane explanation. For a mundane explanation, that is a ridiculous explanation. Oh, it's, because, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. I, you know, I, I live in Nashville, and I was just downtown today, I have never seen. We've got some fairly tall buildings, not as far as tall as Chicago, but never seen anybody with jumping off a building in a wingsuit. First no, of all, wouldn't they, that be absolutely illegal to do something like that? And it is, <laughs> yeah. And 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 they would. Uh, the fact that they didn't fish anybody out of the the Chicago River, uh, given where these sightings were were taking place, um, leads me to believe that it's it's very 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 unlikely. But uh, oh, I, but um, I I should finish that 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 Pilsen story because it's 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 important because it led to our best piece of of of, of evidence. But uh, well, regarding large migratory birds, so this this guy he sees what these people are pointing at. He describes it using those very common descriptors amongst the daytime sighting witnesses, and you know he follows it around. He's like, I got this GoPro camera on my helmet. Like I'm going to follow this thing and I'm going to get as much footage of it as I can before I have to go to work. And so he does. And, uh, and I, I talked to him and I'm telling you when I talked to this witness, what he was saying was authentic to his experience. I, I believe that I believe that what he was telling me he saw is what he truly believed he saw. But he sent me that 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 footage, and uh, he was very helpful about it, by the way. And and hoaxers are not that helpful. If he was making this up, right? He, he's not going to send us the footage or anything, right? And so he sends it over, and we get some some still images of it, and we blow them up. And I'm sorry, but it's a bird, and the the silhouette of this bird very much matches a a great blue heron. In, in flight. 
And so, you know, those profile of, of or those cases that, that match that profile. So daytime sightings of something that people uh, say looks like a man in a wingsuit or a, but that have no associated paranormal phenomena, none of the, the stark terror, um, you know, those, I think that those most likely are misidentifications of a great blue heron. Because if you look at their, their profile in flight, um, you know, they always fly with, with their heads back, right? And so right, right. what happens is when you see this thing in flight with its head back and its, its legs out, it looks like it could be either a, a giant bat because, you know, like bats heads don't stick out super far like a crane or something. Right. Or it looks like it could be a really skinny person because you see, you know, the this weird like bat silhouette, but with like weird skinny legs sticking out behind it. So, yeah. And that combined with the, the, the circumstantial evidence, um, yeah, like that particular profile of sighting, I, I, I think is likely misidentifications. But people love to fixate on that. And people also love to remind me, uh, sometimes politely, sometimes not very politely, that not all of the sightings uh, could possibly be of large birds. And nobody knows that better than me, of course. I'm not saying they all are. I right. was never saying that. But you got to think, though, so too, in a certain percentage could be because... I mean, we're dealing with, I mean, we're dealing with people living in a city, and they may not be familiar with these birds. And and also, right. I think that you make the point that they're they're kind of a new arrival in that area, and in they're, those and they're numbers. unusual as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I see them here. Um, the, uh, the little pond right next to my apartment. They'll they hang out, but and they're. They're very cool to see. And also, since DDT was uh, taken away, large birds have come back mm -hmm. from the point, from the brink of extinction. So people see them more. But I think also you point out in the, in the book that climate change has also helped to bring them a little further north than they normally would have before. Well, it, they've been coming now. They've always migrated area. But what's been happening is... Climate change is getting large migratory birds uh, up north sooner, and they're staying longer. And so what we're seeing is uh, herons specifically, and I, I, I found a, a study that, that somebody had done on this, um, and it was about specifically uh, a different type of heron, but it, it showed how their population uh, in Chicago had exploded you know, over the, the, the course of uh, uh, a decade, you know, from like uh, something like 24 mated pairs in Lincoln Park, which is, you know, the middle of the, the city, 24 mated pairs up to like 300 mated pairs in this park in the middle of Chicago. Yeah, that's a big population explosion of those birds. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, if, if, if you apply that to uh, great blue herons too, um, yeah, I mean, there's just there's a lot more of them in that particular area than there there used to be, and you know, when something like that happens, uh, even over the course of of ten years, which sounds like a, a long time probably to most people, um, it's 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 really not like that's a that's a very sudden change, and uh, and people are are not going to be used. To seeing these things and so you know like i said I, I talked to this guy i've talked to a lot of these witnesses who have had these daytime sightings and they're convinced that they've saw that, that that they've seen something very unusual and i think they have at least to their experience you know right right because if you don't know what it is it's still unusual to you um, right but in the nighttime we're talking about different a whole different thing I mean, the, oh, yes. the, these encounters are much more up close and personal. Yes. Now, well, and that's actually, thank you. That's, that's the other part of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, profile that, uh, that you'll find in the cases that are most likely to be a misidentified large bird is they'll see it flying and it, it's, it's always far away. 
Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, they're less able to get details and it's backlit by the sun and so on and so forth. But yes, the, the sightings that are most likely to be paranormal to have, you know, some, some element of, of, uh, paranormality, I guess, if, if you will, uh, often those sightings are, are very close. Um, very close up. I mean, we, like we'd be talking, in some cases, a matter of, of feet. So it's it's very difficult if something is standing ten feet away from you to mistake a bird for Mothman. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when it's like seven feet tall and it unfurls its wings right in front of you. Right. Exactly. So let, let's talk about some of those cases. Um, and the the big one, I guess you could say, um, the big trouble in Little Village. So what what is happening in this area? What are some of the cases that have happened and some of the occurrences? Sure. So, I mean, Little Village saw um, a pretty good amount, actually, of, uh, of, of sighting reports. Dating, all, I mean, all the way back to 2017, really. It was... That particular area of um, Chicago was one of the most active, earliest uh, sighting uh, locations, and probably the one that I think is is if I had to pick one as sort of like the the iconic one. Um, You've got one where it was, make sure I'm doing this right, there was a, a mother and son, actually. And so they were at home, and uh, they heard something. They, they heard the neighbor's dog barking. That's that's right. And so they look out their uh, back door, you know, turn on the, the back porch light and everything, and and look to see exactly you know what the the neighbor's dog is is barking at and um they see this thing you know this this eight foot tall you know bat winged monster frankly standing uh in in front of their garage you know and and the mom is just overcome immediately like she's so terrified she just she collapses and um the son looks at this thing for you know maybe 10 seconds and uh you know he says he he continues to watch it um until it flaps its wings and and flies away and so you know he was asked to to sort of describe the the physical dimensions of this thing and he said he was able to judge the the wingspan based on the uh, the, the the width of their uh, yard and, and and their garage. And so the thing was standing in, in front of the garage, and from that he was he was able to estimate its its wingspan at at, at fifteen feet. Um, and that was a you know that was an interesting sighting for a lot of reasons. Um, it was one, unfortunately, where the witnesses, they weren't willing to invite investigators into their life. You know, like they, they, they weren't going to have people come over and and um, and you go through their house and, and check everything out. And most of that was due to the reaction that this woman had to her sighting. Um, and it's something that 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 that, you know we've talked about and, and, and we've seen again and, and again in, in the sighting reports, but what they did do was now this guy talked to his, his girlfriend about his sighting and uh, she drew a sketch up of, of what he had seen. So he described it to her and she, she drew the sketch up and she sent it in and um, I, it's not a bird. You know, I can, <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, but, uh, that, uh, that, that sketch, I mean, it, it, it matches the description of, of, of what we've seen. And interestingly enough, I think if you go back and look at 
the descriptions of what um, you know people were giving for the Point Pleasant Mothman. Actually, like it matches those very closely. So, um, it's it's just a, a exciting, you know. I mean, the the reaction described, and I I know that a lot of people will look at that, and you know say that they think that these people were making it up. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I can't prove that they weren't. I, I get, you know, I would ask those people maybe to provide evidence that they were, because if they were, I sure as hell don't know what they're getting out of it. What, um, what would be the point? And that's, right. that's the thing too. I mean, some of these people that, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming I think Manuel probably, interviewed some of these people or some of these people uh, yeah. like actually went and talked to them. I mean, if he filmed them talking about it, I mean, if you, you could probably see like the visceral reaction people would have, like they, they probably had did experience something real in that. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I can vouch for the fear that that is plainly visible on on witnesses faces i you know i i remember specifically i i won't name this witness because you know i i told her that i would protect her her anonymity but you know i i was interviewing this this witness about a sighting she had back in 2001 and i could tell that you know she was afraid and when i mentioned that you know nobody so far as i know um, since I started covering these, had ever been um, actually hurt, and almost nobody has a a second sighting. The relief in her voice, like she was on the verge of crying. She was so relieved to hear that she didn't have to be afraid because the evidence that we have so far shows that there is basically no threat seemingly to, to, to anyone's physical safety. And so that fear it's, it's real. It absolutely is real. And um, I know a lot of people who probably haven't had an experience themselves might find that difficult to understand, but I mean, it, it, it colors their whole life. I mean, this is, this is paradigm shattering stuff for most of these people. Well, uh, as I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I can totally understand if you see a seven foot tall flying man, that, uh, <laughs> that would do it. Right. Uh, one thing I wanted to add about this, and I thought about this at the time, uh, cause there seems to be an element to, this I mean, you've got like it, where this was happening in Little Village, and there seems to have been a lot was happening in that area, and mm-hmm. it was happening in a predominantly Hispanic community, and there were the previous year all these sightings of phantom clowns that were going on, and these were happening in like a predominantly like African American communities, and so you've got two groups of people that you could say they're kind of like living on the edge, a lot of social tensions within the community, you know, Chicago, there's a lot of violence there. Is there, do you think that there's some kind of weird 14 element, some kind of psychology that is going on? That is, that is because I believe people are seeing something, Mm. but is something manifesting in some kind of way because of the environment. Because the clown stuff was weird in 2016. 2017, we get flying creatures. It's right. very strange. Well, um, maybe. Now, I, I, I guess the, the reason that I would um, give pause before supporting that would be because of how widespread the sightings really are. So, I mean, Little Village, as important as it is, um, as far as, you know, it's, it's, it's particular density of, of sightings, uh, by no means, you know, comprises even a, 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 a 
majority percentage, you know, of, of these settings. They're they're all they're all over the place. And it's it's people from every walk of life, from all around Lake Michigan. And and and, and that's why I, I called it the the Lake Michigan Mothman, frankly, is because I was getting a little well, more more than a little, if if I'm being honest. I was getting frustrated by people who always they want to concentrate on Chicago and I get it because Chicago is it's the third largest city in the US. I mean it's a big deal. Millions of people live there and the idea that a flying monster might be, you know, flitting around uh, uh, Chicago like it's it's interesting to people. It's fascinating, but the fact is this phenomenon whatever it is it it isn't local to chicago um it's it's everywhere seemingly within a a couple hundred mile radius of lake michigan although you know frankly like we've got reports of of similar uh sightings from across the 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 country you know most of the ones i've received have been in the the Great Lakes region. And I don't know if that's because there's something special about that region or if, you know, that's just my reach. I mean, I I live in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, A lot of the sighting reports I get in general are from the Midwest. A lot of them are from the Great Lakes region, but I live in the Great Lakes region. So, you know, maybe uh, uh, internet searches are just more likely to get you to me if you know if you live around the the, the Great Lakes. I, I I don't know, but um, I will say, well, specifically regarding Little Village. Now, the sighting them like the the sightings themselves are very very similar to many of the other paranormal sightings like like that that particular profile um and the only common uh or i should say the only specific narrative that i noticed emerging out of the little village sightings was the tendency for people to explain things either in religious terms or using um uh, uh, Spanish language or specifically uh, Mexican folklore to right. describe their experience. So we would hear about like uh, Duende or Lacusa or, or, or something similar. But if you get at the whole describing, it's, it's what everybody else was seeing. Right. Yeah, I, I've I've just wondered about that because it seems like in oh, sure. Chicago as a whole, I mean it's a pretty tense city with the violence and all that, and I I, I did oh. wonder if there was some connection to whenever that these like something gets stirred up collectively, and then all of a sudden people begin to see these things, right. and I mean, it seemed like in 2016 as a whole as a country we were under a, a, a great amount of tension. And all of a sudden, everybody started seeing clowns left and right. It was an election year. It was, so. it was bizarre. And so I've, I've just always wondered about that tension, whether or not that can create these type of things. So let's talk a little bit about some of these other cases that are not in Chicago. And you mentioned uh, one in, probably you mangled this word, Makawanago mm-hmm. in Wisconsin. So that's out outside Mac-Wanago, of Illinois. yeah. Illinois. So right. you well, actually, yeah. Yeah. you investigated this uh, yourself. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I believe this witness contacted Lon originally, and then Lon, you know, gave us the, the, the witness's contact info. And so I, I got a hold of him, and I, I talked to him over the phone. And, um, you know, we were able to, to schedule an, an on-site investigation. Um, very forthright witness, uh but this was another uh, this was another one where um, and this was face to face. A lot of the time I, I only get to talk to people over the, the, the telephone. But this was one where face to face, you know, it was like mid morning when when Emily and, and I were, were out there. And this guy, I mean, he's sweating bullets uh, talking to us uh, uh, about his sighting. I mean, he was 
scared to talk about. And, my, you know, maybe part of it was that we were strangers and it's weird having strangers over to tell them about your monster sighting. But it, I think it was more than that because, you know, it's 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 like late morning on a beautiful day and you know, he's still scared to talk about this sighting. Like he's, he's visibly sweating. He's just, he's terrified. And, um, and, you know, once I, I heard his, his story, I, 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 I understood why. So interestingly enough, his sighting actually took place around the same time in 2017 as the, uh, three MUFON reports that, that kicked everything off. And so what he told us was he uh, was driving home late one night. Um, this is when he was living with his parents. We're actually at his, his parents' house. Uh, they, they weren't home, nor did they see anything or, or anything when, when this happened. But it's uh, anyway, so he's, he's, he's driving home. It's very late, and he's talking to his friend on, on his phone. And so he gets home, and he decides he's going to continue the, the conversation outside. I, I think he didn't want to go inside and, you know, wake his parents up talking on the phone, you know, super loud at like midnight. And so he's, uh, he's sitting out in his van and, and, uh, McQuanago for, for people who, who don't know is it's a, it's a very rural community. And, uh, so they had a, a pretty good size gravel driveway with a, a turnaround at the end of it. Uh, that that led up to their their house, and so he had pulled in, turned the van around so it was facing the street, and sort of backed into his parking spot in that in their their turnaround there, and the only light was about fifty feet away in front of the van, kind of off to the left. Um, there was a lamp post at the end of their driveway, and so. He has the, 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 the van off, and he's talking to his friend on the phone, and he's looking out into the, the, the gloom, but, you know, of course, there's ambient light from that, that lamppost, and he sees, silhouetted in the light of that lamp, he sees this giant humanoid figure. And so, you know, at, at, at first, he just he has no idea what what this is. He, you know, it's just sort of backlit by this lamp. And so he decides he's going to turn his headlights on. And he does. And he sees this eight or nine foot tall, uh, what he described as a like scaly bat dragon like that. I believe those were the actual words he used. And so basically what what what, what he said he saw was this like eight or nine foot tall uh, humanoid with scaly skin. Uh, and he knew it was scaly because it had been misting out all day. And, uh, and uh, hi- historical weather data confirms that. It had indeed been misting out that all, all day of the, the, the day of his sighting. Um, and so, you know, it was still misting. And he said that he could tell by how wet and sort of reflective its its skin was you know he could he could tell that it was kind of scaly and so he said it was standing there and it had these bat like wings and it was standing in a position where now if you can picture a bat hanging upside down how it has its wings sort of crossed uh, uh across itself uh that but standing upright so it's standing there in front of him and it, and it has its its wings crossed over its body in front of it. And he said it had these huge black eyes and he's staring at this thing and it's staring at him. And he's, he starts narrating to his friend what he's seeing, you know, and at first his friend can't believe him, but the fear in his voice was, was pretty convincing. And so it, 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 it didn't take very long, you know, for his, his friend to decide that, Hey, maybe something real is, is happening here. And so uh, this is in the span of, of seconds, you know, of, of, of course. And so he stares at the saying and it stares at him. And he said it seemed to blur slightly and disappear. And so he wasn't sure. I asked him about this. He wasn't sure if that meant that whatever this thing was, uh, you know, moved faster than maybe his eye could see and like shot up into the air or something, or if it just, you know, phased out of existence or, or, or whatever, but it was gone. 
And so uh, he decided, you know, probably pretty wisely that he wasn't going to stick around out outside after that. And so he 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 went inside and um, and that was it. I mean, he 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 never saw it again. But it you know, it it had a lasting impact on him uh, enough that he was willing to talk about it um, no matter how scared it, it made him to to you know, two paranormal investigators uh, at the actual site of his encounter. And again, this is one of those where, and I, I can't stress this enough for, for everybody listening. Um, these people have literally nothing to gain by, by coming forward with these stories. I, I, I understand, you know, how some of them sound, but unless, you know, you've had the experience of, standing there talking to, you know, just one, one grown man talking to another, um, and, and seeing like the fear on these people's faces, um, and, and, and how they, they react to their experience. There's something, there's something authentic there. Uh, they're, they're, they're not making this up. And, and, uh, you know, that was, that was very apparent in, in this particular case. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's no reason people make this up and the guy who's on the phone was almost like a uh, second witness in a way because he could hear that something was actually bothering this guy yeah i thought that one was 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 very compelling uh i want to i want to hit this point about Mm -hmm. these mothman encounters and association with strange lights and with ufos some of that's going on yeah, definitely. I mean, there have been um, strange lights, uh, UFOs, uh, reported in the same areas uh, as as these sightings. I think, well, probably the two uh, uh, instances that that uh, come to mind as, as as being especially interesting. Well, right off the 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 abat, like one of the first, like one of those first three. Mufon reports the the person who who wrote it uh, this this woman uh, said that after her sighting she saw this this weird green light that couldn't have been an airplane or anything and 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 that's what 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 you know ter- well that helped terrify her um, on on top of of you know her already unnerving experience but then you know I I talked to. A, uh, a witness out in Indiana who actually lived, uh, still does actually live by the um, uh, Prairie Creek Reservoir, which has been a site in Indiana that has actually seen a pretty good amount of uh, you know sighting reports. I mean, it's it's mentioned in in, in the book specifically as a in an area where where we've received a, a pretty good. Uh, amount of, of sightings and so you know I talked to this guy out there now he hadn't seen uh, Mothman or, or anything but what he had seen in that area for years were uh, these weird glowing orbs and so you know he would see them uh, just sort of floating along and um, uh, you know they, they were always they were in close proximity to the, the, the same area as the, the, the Mothman sightings out there. And so you, you, you see this uh, in pretty much every case where somebody reports, you know, UFO activity or, 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 or strange lights. There's no direct connection, you know, like nobody sees uh, this flying humanoid interacting with these lights. Uh, it's very rare to see them in the same place at the same time. Uh, but the correlation exists, you know, uh, very similar to the, the, the Point Pleasant flap where you've got these UFO sightings happening like concurrently with the, the Mothman sightings, you know. So, again, like there's no uh, e- existing causal relationship that we can point to. Um, but at the same time, it's very interesting that, that we're getting this phenomenon reported in the same place as the, the flying humanoids. Right. And this, you got 
UFOs and like small little lights too that are being seen, um, which is particularly interesting. I know that uh, you've talked to Tim Renner and he's talked about seeing those same kind of things on Bigfoot hunts, no less. Yeah, I, well, uh, you know, Emily and I have been going out into the, the Kettle Moraine State Forest with Jay Pachochin pretty frequently. And the last couple times that we did, uh, we, I mean, we all saw this uh, very peculiar white ball of, of light. The first time we saw it, uh, we were all, and we always go out at, at, at night. And so the first time we saw it, we were standing on, on this trail and, and looking back down the, the, the trail from, from where we had come. And, and we just all happened to be looking in the same direction. And, and over the, 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 the treetops, just over them, uh, darting across the trail, we all saw this this white glowing orb, you know, it was there for a, a few seconds. You saw it appear, moved across the trail and, and then just disappeared. And the second time uh, we were walking along and uh, I was kind of out in front. I was with uh, Adam Benedict of the, the Pine Barrens Institute who had, had come along this, uh, this, this particular time. And uh, Emily and, and Jay were, behind us on, on the trail and unfortunately for Adam he was looking in a completely different direction but I was looking straight ahead and I saw another one of these these white lights this white orb and it came down and it looked like it was in the trees you know because it, it there were trees behind it you could see that there were trees behind it because it was going in front of them but there was all, there were also trees in in front of it and as it it uh, it just it appeared towards the top of the trees and then dropped straight towards the ground, and you could see it illuminating the trees as it 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 went down. And now this is an area where uh, Jay has been collecting Bigfoot and Dogman sighting reports for years. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. It's 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 not uh, it's not just Mothman. Uh, it's um, it's Bigfoot. It's it's uh, it's it's dog man. It's uh, it's a, basically any monster you can think of. Um, there are almost universally uh, other paranormal phenomena like related to the the areas of, of those sightings. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's there's always this cross um, pollination or cross. Um, Contaminate. I don't even know what the word would be. It's just like it. It. It seems like you're you're always dealing with more than one phenomenon. I, I did want to hit a point about uh, one of the other pictures that you had in the book, and that was the one um, Pulaski Road photograph. And there's a picture of I guess what the guy said was a flying humanoid, but some but that was tried to have been explained away as a kite. <laughs> Oh, uh, is that the one? Okay, that's the one by the the statue of the, right, the Native statue. American. Right. I don't think that was a kite. Actually, I think that yeah. ki that uh, kite was the lazy, dismissive answer. Um, if you look at that area, okay, one. Let's starting from the 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 very beginning. So this witness took uh, three photographs, and this uh, object, whatever it is, only appeared in the second. Now, if it was a kite, uh, it would have been in all three. Also, if, if you look at that area of Chicago, there is no place that anybody is flying a kite um, that would put something, uh, well, that, 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 that would put the kite um, in a position to, to be photographed from, from where he was standing, unless you were you know, willing to like fly your kite in the middle of a busy you know, Chicago, uh, Chicago city street. Um, now, I did have Emily look at it, and she is something of a butterfly enthusiast. Um, and so when she looked at it, um, she thought that it looked like it uh, just its its shape matched a uh, what's called a, a uh, question mark butterfly, which is an actual type of butterfly. I, I did not know that previously. And... 
Now, relatively recently, we received a photograph from somebody who had, you know, thought that they had uh, potentially captured something uh, anomalous while taking photos at, I believe this was last year's Lollapalooza in Chicago. Uh, That turned out to be a monarch butterfly. Um, That actually is what got us started on this whole uh, uh, thought process of thinking maybe the the Pulaski photo is also a, a, a butterfly because if you look at the profile of, of the monarch butterfly in this other photograph, um, it looks very similar to the, the, the Pulaski photo. And so if you apply that to the, the Pulaski photo and then think about, well, okay, so we know that this guy took three photos. This only appeared in the second photo. What could do that? Well, now it's very, very difficult to judge the uh, size or distance of an object in the air, um, especially one you're you're not familiar with. And so, oh, well, and also especially considering that this guy didn't see anything unusual at the time uh, when he was taking this 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 photograph, um, I'm of a mind that a butterfly likely flew in front of this guy for just a second uh, while he was taking his photographs. It was relatively close. Of course, he didn't notice it because it's a butterfly, um, and uh, and that's how we got our our Pulaski photograph. Um, I want to say I mentioned that in in the book too. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, you do, you do. Okay, great. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, and I was always frustrated by that that kite explanation because it clearly was just this like dismissive brush off um, from people who at at that point in the investigation, maybe from the very beginning, we're just sort of determined to not actually investigate anything. Like, they didn't care about investigating it. They just wanted to be the smartest person in the room, you know? And it was just such a, like I said, just such a lazy, dismissive explanation with absolutely no bearing in, in, in reality if you actually engaged with this witness's, you know, testimony so yeah it's uh yeah sorry that's 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 just one that i i i, I have strong feelings about because <laughs> you know like it's just i it was just a certain people's style of investigation that we've been fighting against since the advent of our investigation where people they want to insert themselves into it and they want to make it about themselves but they don't want to do the work. And so, you know, they've never spoken to any witnesses and they, they haven't actually like engaged with the subject matter. Um, they're not really familiar with the investigation, but they're very willing to come out and say that this thing was a kite with no evidence to support it. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, some of the explanations are just are, are in themselves more ludicrous than what they're trying to explain away. Uh, for you and the time that we have left, mm-hmm. what is your favorite sighting in this book? Oh, is boy. One that stands I, out to you? I would others? say, I mean, if, if it could be a set of sightings, I would say the, the Woodstock sightings. Um, that was another one where, you know, Emily and I went down there and the initial witness uh, who had his sighting in, I believe it was February of, of 2019. Um, you know, this is, this is a guy where, you know, he didn't expect to see a monster on, on his way home. You know, he had just, he'd gone out to Walgreens. He needed a couple of things and he's on his way home and he's crossing or driving past the, the entrance to the, the Dewfield pond conservation area and he sees this monster cross the the road in front of him. You know, uh, uh, this this was a an unusual one. I guess, I guess kind of like the uh, McWanago witness, where it didn't necessarily exactly match uh, the the or completely match the the idea of a. a, a, a smooth bat-like uh, flying humanoid because what he said he saw was this hairy uh, uh, you know almost Bigfoot like creature with with these big bat wings like walk across the street in front of him 
And, uh, you know, Emily and I went down there and, you know, I, we, we talked to this guy, we talked to his wife, you know, um, they had a lot to lose by coming forward with, with this story. You know, they oh, yeah. were professionals and I, you know, I, they invited us down. I, I like I said, I, we talked to him face to face. I I've seen their house. They were nice enough to take us around, uh, the, the, the sighting, uh, uh, area and and show us kind of where everything happened and we even found a really weird footprint while we were there which which was interesting and um, and yeah these like just specifically those witnesses were the epitome of people who had everything to lose by by coming to us with a a, a story like that and that made a big impression on me and their their credibility well i mean the both of their credibility but only the 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 man had the the uh, sighting of course but um their their credibility was outstanding and to have that sighting lead to the other sightings that it did i mean most notably the one where the witness was uh concerned enough where he called 911 and you know i i I got a hold of the uh, McHenry County uh, Sheriff's uh, Office down there, and, and they they sent me a copy of the the incident uh, uh, detail report. I mean, it shows that not too long after the uh, initial witness had his sighting, um, this other guy uh, right across actually from the Dewfield Pond Conservation Area. So this guy was. Uh, he was standing in a, a parking lot, and on the edge of the parking lot, you have this this chain link fence, and on the other side of that, you have the uh, McHenry County Fairground, and so that's actually right across from the Dewfield Pond Conservation Area, and it would be directly in the path of where this thing uh, reportedly went uh, after the uh, initial witness saw it, and so this is sometime after. The, uh, the 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 first sighting, but yeah, this guy said he saw basically the exact same thing, and that it, it charged the fence, and that uh, um, he was scared enough that he called nine one one, and we have the the incident detail report showing that he did in fact call nine one one. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, yeah, it's I mean it's that's in the the uh, book too. You know, I, I can't just talk about something like that and then and then not show it to you. You know, I I've. Uh, I, I did go and I redacted some of the personal information because I do feel strongly that people deserve their their privacy. You know, like nobody needs to contact this guy. Uh, nobody needs to to you know bother the sheriff's deputy about it. Like it's it's in the report. So, but uh, yeah, I, I I think Woodstock definitely had the greatest impact on on me overall. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Tobias, this has been fabulous, man. I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been a great subject to talk about. Uh, can you tell people where they can uh, get the book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can purchase the Lake Michigan Mothman High Strangest in the Midwest on uh, Amazon. So you can either go to the, the search bar in Amazon and, and type in Lake Michigan Mothman. Otherwise, you can always find a link to it on our website, which is singular 40 com. So if you're interested in checking out the, the Singular 40 in Society, I would encourage you to go there. Or you can follow us on literally any social media platform you can think of, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. And if you are interested enough in the Lake Michigan Mothman uh, or what we do at the Singular 40 in Society that you want to be a part of it, I would encourage you uh, to check us out at uh, patreon.com slash singular 40 Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tobias. This has been a great, thank great you. episode. Thank you for being part of episode 299 on the cusp of 300. Happy um, to be here. <laughs> stay on the line for me. I'm just going to close this section out. And guys, I will sure. be back. I will be back to close out this episode on Conspiranormal.
Hey, welcome back to Conspiracy Normal, guys. This is Adam. I am flying solo this week, in case you guys didn't notice, because uh, Serfiel is on vacation. But he will be back to talk about that in a forthcoming Patreon episode where we'll talk a little bit about his vacation and a few other things that uh, we've kind of got on the agenda that will be out on the Friday after this show posts. So guys, look forward to that. Episode 300, as I mentioned before, is next. So we're going to have a big show. So this show is a little bit short this week. But uh, we did have two-hour episode with Mark Anthony Wyatt, and then a two-hour episode before that with Jerry and Nish from Nox Mente. So we're gonna have a short episode because next time we're probably gonna have like some ungodly three to four-hour thing. So just enjoy that for episode three hundred. Um, all the usual stuff, guys. Please support us on Patreon. That's uh, patreoncom slash normal. We're starting to put a lot of different. Um, episodes up there and trying to do that every week uh one dollar at the moment gets you in and also leave us a review on itunes and subscribe to the youtube channel at uh conspiracy normal podcast so that's it guys uh we're really stoked for episode 300 and uh we will be back with the full crew next week on conspiracy normal Please consider becoming a Patreon at www.patreon.com slash conspiranormal or leave a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com and please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.